My guest tonight played Tahani on the amazing NBC series, The Good Place. Now she's the host of TBS's The Misery Index, as well as a judge on Legendary on HBO Max, which just got picked up for another season. Good God, she's doing so, so much. Please welcome the incredibly busy and talented Jamila Jamil. Jamila, how are you? I'm good. I'm curious how you're doing during lockdown as a person. How are you handling this experience of being locked down? I am worryingly fine. Like, I am more afraid of leaving lockdown. This is, I, I didn't have any friends until I was about 19. So I, this, my entire youth was locked down. I've been training for this my whole life. This is my Olympics. I was made for this moment. I was born for this. Wait, you, is this true? You had no friends until you were 19? Really, I mean, if you've seen my Twitter, is it that hard to believe? Uh, <laughs> I, <am>. um, <laughs> I was just super, super shy and incredibly socially inept. And so I just wasn't great with, wasn't great with people. Yeah, yeah, well. Uh, uh, you know, I have, I, have, I have my 12, I have my special 12. Yeah, it's, uh, that's very good. A, f uh, a few friends of high quality is all one needs. Exactly. Um, I have uh, about eight friends of very low quality. So I've, I've got the formula wrong. And if they're watching right now, you know who you are. <laughs> I was excited because I heard that you got a puppy. Is that, was that because of the quarantine you got a puppy? Do you think that helped you make the decision or? For sure. I think, well, I've always wanted a dog and I've just never had time because I've been on planes and trains and automobiles. I've been moving around consistently and knowing that I knew this wasn't going to be three months. I knew that this was just going to go and go and go and go. And so I just thought, I'm going to spend a year in my house and I have no intention of picking up any new skills, really. Uh, I, this is the time to become a dog parent. And so I have gotten a little cute, horny ginger biscuit in my house. What is the dog's name? The dog's name is Barold. Uh, I was going to name him Barry because I like mundane human names for animals. And then a friend of mine is so posh that she mistakenly thought that Barry was short for Barold, which is an infinitely dumber name. And I've so never even heard of the name Barold. Is Barold a real name? No, oh, it's definitely not. She thought because of Harry and Harold, that was her logical prediction. And so Barold was the dumber name. Barold is the name that gets you bullied at secondary school. That's the name of a, that's, it's a character building name for a dog. Do you, do you think that works? If you give someone a strange name, they're taunted, they feel humiliated, and then they grow into a stronger person? And a talk show host. That was low. <laughs> that, was, that was uncalled for. I have a stupid name as well. I mean, my name is basically the Indian equivalent of Duran Duran. I mean, my <laughs> <laughs> I never thought of that. I think you have a beautiful name. I love your name, but I didn't think of that. It is, it's Duran Duran. Yes. Oh, I love your name too. Uh, but yeah, I think Barold is, it's a, it, it makes for a better person or dog at the end. So, um, a dog is a lot of responsibility. Are you handling that all right? I mean, are there things the dog is doing in quarantine that's bothering you? It's just, it's just the shagging. The shagging and the biting, the, just the horny teenage vampire of it all. It's Riverdale by night in my house. He Wait. Humping and he, he started humping at nine weeks old. And like, I know that the kids are growing up fast, but Jesus Christ. Nine weeks old and he's humping like crazy. Yeah, so his little pink lipstick at uh, nine weeks. Okay, as first he, of all. His, as he humped his little blanket, which we now call a, a ghost, which I shouldn't have said on this show, and I'm sorry. Shall I leave? No, you shouldn't leave. We'll just process what you've said. Uh, yeah, I don't think you should refer to Barold's uh, little lipstick. Men don't like that. We don't like it when it's referred to that way. Trust me. Fair. Okay. <laughs> Take it easy. He's, he's a good dog. He just, it's, it's a lot of responsibility, but it's incredibly fun. And it's also, this is, it's a, it's a weird time to get dogs. You can't socialize them. So I'm worried I'm going to have like a little agoraphobic sort of politically incorrect dog that is going to be afraid of all other people that don't look exactly like me. So, right, uh, right. 
I don't know how it's exactly. Going. You're because of uh, the quarantine. Um, you're raise, You're going to have a racist dog. That's what's going to happen. Yeah. Not just that. Apparently, you have to like. They're afraid of people wearing hats, of people wearing masks, everything. So I have no idea how it's going to go. I'm going to age very fast. I can tell. <laughs> I, can tell. <laughs> I don't think so. What do you think is going to change? Uh, I, I love hearing your opinions on things, uh, and and you you uh, have a very good way of looking at things. Do you think society is going to change in a fundamental way because of this pandemic and this quarantine? Yes. I do. I think it, there have been lots of downsides to what we've seen in humanity this year, but I also think one thing I've enjoyed is seeing our value system shift. And mm -hmm. so we have stopped glamorizing and glorifying things like wealth or celebrity and all these different things that like we've entered this moment of complete, like eat the rich, drag the celebrities. And like, I log on Twitter every day just to see like whose leaving party it is, who's been canceled today. Right, right. I think that we've realized that the people who are important in this world aren't the ones on thousand dollar a night balcony is showing off their diamonds. It's the people who are the essential workers and the healthcare workers. So I think that was a much needed shift because we were out of control with the materialism, etc. So I think that that is a good thing. I also think handshaking is cancelled, which I'm personally very excited about. It's something that I felt was very forced on me as a human because I, I have a lot of male friends and um, well, I mean I've only got 12 friends so it can't be that many but I, I know a lot of men and I know that a lot of men have their hands on their penises whether or not they need to just sometimes when they're on the phone they're having a play having a fiddle having a rearrange and then they're shaking your hand shortly afterwards so you have a penile imprint no 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 my <laughs> hands I want you to my hands are up here <laughs> no no it's done, Conan. It's done. I can't okay, believe I've been putting up with this for so long. I am furious. Okay, listen. You're mistaken. I feel, uh, as a member of the male species, sort of, uh, I, we've run a few tests, and yes, technically I'm male. No, we're not touching our penises all the time. All the, all the time. Just Unless during. I was otherwise engaged, it's on your dick. <laughs> <laughs> you can replace me with a monkey. No, no, no. You're, it, it's, <laughs> basically, it's you're saying it's why I had the talk show desk for so many years. <laughs> <laughs> no, not true. There's too much shame there. So I, I, I think you might be right about some guys, but yes. I'm really red. <laughs> <laughs> that image alone makes me not want to shake anybody's hand ever again. So... Yeah. Uh, and it's over. It's it, over. It, it can't be twisted for anything. It's for handshaking. Um, let me okay. let me switch to a somewhat uh, classier area of conversation, and then we can always switch back sure. to to um, what men do with their hands and their penises. Um, I want to mention you have a podcast, uh, and a lot of people have podcasts. I really love your podcast. Uh, the The title is I Way. And um, it, it feels like a very important topic uh, to, to be talking about these days, not just the normal chit chat. Uh, can you tell us what I Weigh is all about for anyone who hasn't heard it? So I Weigh was a social movement I started two years ago to change the way that people measure themselves. So via their inequalities rather than pounds and kilos and the weighing scale. But it has evolved over the last two years to be a kind of full mental health movement and a movement against shame. And so, Aside from my, my penis shaming that just happened, I don't believe in shame. I clearly don't have any, <laughs> not a trace left. Uh, uh -huh. I, uh, <laughs> I am uh, bankrupt to f to give. And so I wanted to make this podcast, a mental health podcast, where we would explore all the kind of most stigmatized topics and have people from all backgrounds, whether they are celebrities or they are experts or scientists, et cetera, come on and talk in a very demystifying, destigmatizing way about things that everyone's going through, but we just don't talk about it enough. And I had planned to do this podcast before the pandemic hit, but it just came at a time where people didn't have access to therapists, they didn't have access to each other. And so it's been uh, strangely helpful, I think, for some people in just hearing that you are so not alone in all of the things that you are experiencing. 
This speaks to something that uh, I think about a lot. Both of us know a lot of celebrities and we're accustomed to people thinking that celebrities, um, they take a quick glance and they say, oh, this person's, uh, they don't have anything to worry about and um, they must love themselves. And it's been like a personal crusade of mine to say, uh, pardon my French, but like everybody's up and, 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 um, so many people would look at you and say, this person, you know, how could she talk about shame? She's so beautiful when, of course, you could talk about that. You're a human being. You have the same experiences as everyone else. And so that's probably something, demystifying that, I think, is really important. Yeah, I mean, I grew up with just such glossy role models, and I didn't know anything. I didn't even know about people making mistakes or or they're, you know, growing in public. I never saw anyone grow in public. It was just such a glossy veneer of bullshit. And so it made me feel so isolated in all of my experiences because I've suffered with my mental health issues for 20 years or so. And so and so my family members, I thought there was something so wrong with us. I didn't know because I didn't have any transparent role models who told the truth. And so for better or for worse, I'm determined to be as transparent as I can. And sometimes that leads to some questionable moments <laughs> publicly. But it also means that I'm being willing to be the anti-celebrity and just be vulnerable and human and flawed. And right. That other kids can know that it's okay if you, like, a, a isn't deaf. Right. You have to do better. And so I think that I've tried to, i tried to be what I didn't have when I was younger. And, uh, and I, I'm just, it's a social experiment. I don't know how it's going. <laughs> Well, I, uh, we've been talking about, maybe I'll come on your podcast because I have uh, a lot of things to talk about in this arena. Um, I would love to. I also think, and I want to know what you think about this, but I think that artists in particular are almost more likely to be messed up. You know, there's something, I think, in you, there has to be something in you that would drive you to do such a weird job and to need the... the approval and applause and the love of other people i think there is something inherently like there's a not to turn this into a therapy session but i think there's a little hole inside of all of us and i also think artistry comedy uh song lyrics etc i think that they are a way of a kid who doesn't know how to communicate uh learning how to communicate with the world yeah. so i think yeah. in itself it speaks to some sort of like kink or damage in there that you know this is how we process it to make other people happy Definitely. I've been saying this for 27 years. My nightly comedy show is a cry for help. <laughs> <laughs> and instead of anybody saying, how can we help you? Uh, they say, great, we're wrapped for the night. Let's do another one tomorrow. Um, so, uh, yeah. But maybe this will help really get the word out that I'm in desperate need of, uh, of assistance. I want to make sure I mention your new show, which we said just got picked up. Congratulations on that. Legendary. This is about this whole culture of ballroom. Some people may think they know what ballroom means, but they probably don't. Can you explain? Yeah, so I think a lot of people imagine the waltz when they think of ballroom, but ballroom mm -hmm. is actually an underground scene that kind of nurtured young Black and Latinx talent, uh, often queer and trans folk, who had been shunned from their own personal communities and found their kind of chosen families within the ballroom scene. And it's full of art and fashion and music and voguing, the type of dance that people think Madonna invented, but she didn't. She was paying mm -hmm. homage back then to the ballroom scene. And so we have made a dance competition about ballroom because it's been really frustrating to spend decades watching mainstream pop culture borrow from ballroom. So like vernacular, the way we speak, like spill the tea, shade, all these different common phrases that we have in our day-to-day -day language, fashion, art, music, dance, runway, all of it comes from ballroom, but ballroom never gets uh, credited and it never gets paid and so we wanted to make sure that for the first time people realize where all of this comes from and start to recognize the people who invented it and so it's a cool show and it's kind of half documentary style half competition and I'm really proud of it and I'm really happy that a show that is so unusual in this current climate is being picked up for a second season and given and a am I right the ballroom community um, was really a community when it uh, started out, they really felt like they weren't welcome anywhere else because they represented the other, the different. Exactly, like the most marginalized people. And so it's this 
you know, all we hear about in the news, like these really sad and depressing or scary stories about what happens to that community, but the ballroom community is actually full of so much joy and love and talent and more community than like I've ever seen in, in cis communities. It's just so open. No, they feel like they have nothing to lose and they have everything to give each other. I have never, ever, ever been in an environment ever like I was shooting this show, just full of just such resilience and like inspiring, funny, cool people. I've never felt like more of a boring, stuck up English in my entire life. Would I uh, stick out in the in the barroom community? It would be you and me in a corner. It would be you and me in a corner, everyone else <laughs> twirling and dropping and and sounding and looking much cooler there. I am always the fish out of water wherever yeah, I go. Well, uh, I'll, be, I'll be in the tank because I've never, <laughs> never felt like more of an arsehole, honestly, ever. I'm, I'm honored to be there. You're a uh, you're a judge uh, on on Legendary. You You say, that you can't dance, and you posted a video to prove you can't dance. I think we have a clip of that right now. <laughs> I think everyone can dance. It's just the willingness to put yourself out there. So uh, I, I approve of your dancing. You know, and you you also have been on record as saying, clearly you have many talents, but you think you have odd talents. You think you have strange talents. For example, you say that you can stretch your face. I don't even know what you're talking about. Oh yeah, so okay, so I have some a collagen disorder, which means I have not enough collagen in my body, which makes me incredibly bendy, so. Oh my God. Oh my God, look at that. CDI. <laughs> Wait, so you don't have enough collagen, so it's is it just in your face or like your whole body? No, no, it's my whole it's my whole body. It's like my arms. Okay. Oh my god. Oh, oh, oh my god. It looks I used to get out of gym class by telling my uh my sports teacher that I'd like broken my elbow. <laughs> <laughs> that, my shoulder, oh my god comes in and out um yeah i'm just like good in bed bad at sports that's the only way to describe it not that good in bed even just bad at everything <laughs> i can also kiss my own ass i'm not gonna do that right now you can kiss your own ass. Well, no one else would do it, so I had to learn. Which way do you go? Do you go back? I go forward. You go forward and... Yeah, but I, go, I tend to go forward. It's easier. Just a little... I learned that when I was nine years old. It was not a sexual thing. I'm not like my dog, Barreled. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm just like, I, I, I belonged in a circus, not school. Um, I would go to that circus. I would go there. <laughs> I'd be the creep that was at the circus every single day in the front I row. With my dislocated shoulder. <laughs> I find uh, a dislocated soldier to be very erotic. I just do. So that's my, you actually nailed my kink. One of 75,000 kinks. Everyone watching, put your erections away. <laughs> okay. As I told you, this is a show primarily for children and... <laughs> Hosted by a child. Uh, yeah, hosted by a child, <laughs> a man child, sadly. Um, I love talking to you, I really do. I look forward to talking to you uh, in the future. I guess I'll go on your podcast. Maybe yeah, you'll come on. Yeah, me on my podcast. And also like Conan, for all the shit I talk to you, you are massively, massively in so many ways, my hero. And oh, so wow. Things that I do, I do okay. because I'm just copying you, so. Well, you are, uh, you are, <laughs> A big, big celebrity crush of mine. I will say that, and uh, um, I don't have a hall pass. Not that that would interest you, because you wouldn't be interested. But my <laughs> wife, my hall pass is with my wife for all people that have been dead for 150 years. She says I can, if I meet Emily Bronte, I'm allowed to do it with her. So, <laughs> and I have a similar pass system. It's the only one that works. Right. Eleanor, Eleanor Roosevelt, one of my hall passes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, anyway, thank you so much for being here. Let me make sure I mention Legendary is streaming now 
on HBO Max, and a new episode of The Misery Index airs next Thursday right here on TBS. Uh, Jamila, thank you so much for being here, and good luck with your horny ginger dog. Thank you very much. Love you. Thank you. <laughs>